Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so picking up in our last video, or I guess from our last video with uh, Superman Rebirth, this one's kind of like an interim story, right? And like Bendis will do that from time to time. It's not an interim story in so far as it's like has nothing to do with the main event. It's one of these interim stories, like it transitions from something to something else. And, and Bendis really does that frequently, right? Like in the middle of a story arc, you'll have like an issue where things happen and you'll end up being left with like a lot more questions than you get answers to because it's kind of building up to really the sort of revelation and like the final issue, which is probably what'll happen in number six, if not, in like the next story arc. But in the last one, we had basically picked up where like Jonathan had essentially led like his father, led Superman uh, directly to where, where you know, Jor-El was at, the grandfather of, of, or I guess the father of Superman and the grandfather of John. And then in turn, like once they arrive, there's this massive conflict between really like the Thanagarians and like like all these crazy races, right? Like this warrior race called the Kuns. I'm not really sure how you pronounce that. It's K-H-U-N-D-S. I never really knew how to pronounce their name, uh, but it's like this huge conflict taking place. And the funny thing is that Superman's powers aren't really working the way they're supposed to in the sense that like he can't really uses x-ray vision his hearing doesn't work that well now one of the things to hit on here is that that bendis doesn't really say that superman's powerless right and that's how some people will interpret it like well bendis is saying superman has no powers no not at all first of all when it comes to like to to super hearing there is no sound in space except for like what's going on inside ships so outside of that like you really don't know a whole lot about what people are saying i mean you can kind of hear to a degree it's kind of finicky it's happened off and on over the course of superman's mythos but his x-ray vision is having a hard time because there's literally everything everywhere so it's like difficult to tell what all's going on at least from where he's at in the moment now of course like moving closer he'd probably be able to pick up on people or be able to see inside of a ship if he was like standing right outside of it but in the middle of all that he's basically like met by the arrival of of jor-el and of course he and he and jonathan also start jumping into the fray as well now here's the funny thing about this and this is what bendis really kind of hits on the nose is is on the surface you would expect Superman to kind of like jump into the fray and start battling. But the, the funny thing about this is that Superman's like, I don't really know what's going on. And so because I don't know what's going on, what I need are answers. What I need is to know what's happening here in order to figure out like how all this started and like who's at fault, if anybody's at fault at all. So what it is, is it turns into a situation of like disarming people. Now, the reason why, one of the big reasons why Superman does this is because Jonathan's here. And he basically says like, Jonathan needs to see how a superhero is supposed to function. Now, the opposite, opposite side of that coin is if Jonathan was not here, I would just fight everybody. That kind Kind of seems to be what's going on but again it's sort of like superman would do this anyway right i mean that's what we would expect from from this kind of a character is he would start asking questions and trying to figure things out now behind the scenes batman would probably fight and then like figure it out at the same time which is kind of interesting but superman starts traveling from one group to the next sort of speaking to them in a way that like meshes with them right like he's kind of adapting to how it is that they function as a people so the thanagarians are a very proud race and so it's hey look like i realize that you guys are you guys you guys do your own thing i don't have authority over you what i need you guys to do is stand down and ultimately they do right because if superman showed up on the doorstep of the thanagarian race and said stop shooting they would ignore him and they probably start shooting at him right because it's like they're a very very ancient and very haughty race and it's, you don't tell us what to do we've we were around when you were you know before you were even thought of when it comes to the the kund race because they're basically like a warrior race it's stand down or i'm going to destroy you all and then once he actually gets to the trillium it's well this is a race that respects superman so i'm going to speak them and you know speak to them in that that fashion they recognize me for my strength and so on and so forth and so i will address that accordingly is one of these things where he kind of becomes everything to everyone as he as he sort of makes his way through and once they're all done once they're all standing down then he talks directly with uh with jor-el and again that's when things kind of get murky jor-el's a very murky character here he's very cloak and dagger and he really has been throughout bendis's run and even before bendis when he was mr oz it was dr manhattan yanked him from krypton's final destruction and then brought him to what's basically the present day more or less or at least he's been here you know for a, a huge amount of time and and like he was he was very mysterious we didn't really know what his motivations were and even now we don't fully know all we know is that like he took Jonathan with him into space so Jonathan could understand what it meant to be a hero and how small he is in the grand scheme of things and the impact he can have if he allow if he acts as a hero and allows his legacy to flourish. But but in this discussion between Superman and his father, and of course, one, they're speaking at super speed, and two, like there's a lot of I don't really trust you that's, that's going on here. You have George, you have Superman who's kind of like, okay, so basically what you're telling me here is this is all just circumstantial, right? Like you were just going through space one day, and then like all these races started attacking you all of a sudden. And like Rogelzar is back, the guy who originally basically led to the destruction of Krypton, who, you know, Bendis kind of changed that up a bit, but uh, you have him here, you have like General Zod, both of whom escaped the Phantom Zone. You've got like these guys here. So basically you were minding your own business and you're just caught 
in the middle of a conflict like this. It's, I don't believe that for a second, but they don't really get any answers here. They don't really get any straight explanations. And even when Superman asks questions, he doesn't get straight answers. His father kind of blows him off and says, hey, look, once I fix my ship, then we'll be able to teleport out of here. And so it's, it's almost one of these things where it's like his father's kind of buying time and basically saying like, I'm trying to fix the ship and everything and trying to think of an answer to give his, give, give Superman and to give Jonathan Kent once they leave so that they can, you know, essentially be, be satisfied. In a lot of ways, Jor-El plays on his familiar, uh, familiar ties with them. Like, well, I'm their family. They'll believe me. You know, and it's, it's, it's intriguing to kind of see that happen. Of course, you also have Rogel Zal who basically comes back, uh, Rogel Zal rather, who basically comes back and then like starts attacking Superman. And of course, you've got General Zod who shows up and does the same thing. Now, again, the motivation behind these characters is that Rogel Zar believed he was doing the right thing by saying, hey, look, like Krypton's going to be destroyed and so on and so forth. And then you have General Zod who's just an enemy of Superman, right? But like where Rogel Zar thought he was doing the right thing and then eventually came to blows with Superman, they've both become his enemies. And then when Superman locked him away in the Phantom Zone, their motivation is to come back and like destroy Superman. So it's it's relatively thin, but it works for the for the story as it's being told. But it's kind of a funny thing because Jonathan fighting fighting Zod is no small thing. And even Jonathan kind of overestimates his powers to a degree. Like he just kind of flies out there haphazardly and just starts like fighting General Zod. And that's not what you do. You're talking about a guy who, who has who has powers on par with Superman, in some cases, can even be more powerful than Superman, that basically has like all this tactical military training behind him. Because remember, when it comes to Superman as a hero, in comparison to General Zod, Superman's flying by the seat of his pants. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's just kind of out there doing his thing and fighting the good fight and hoping that he wins. But Zod has like all these tactical maneuvers and all these motivations and schemes. What always defeats General Zod is his arrogance. That's what always costs him the victory. If he cast his arrogance aside and fought Superman without any kind of emotional connection or emotional attachment and focus only on how can I legitimately beat this guy, then he would crush Superman. And it probably wouldn't even be by a little bit. Like it would be, it'd be by a lot. And so with Jonathan, like he's really kind of in over his head and Superman's dealing with Rogel's all at the same time this is happening with with uh with Jonathan and so for the most part you look at this and it's kind of like okay so these guys are basically like almost outmatched <laughs> they're in a pinch because on one side you've got John I'm sorry you've got uh Jor-El trying to fix the ship otherwise he would jump in you've got Rogel attacking Superman fighting him which again can easily hold his own against Superman and then you've got Zod fighting Jonathan and Zod wouldn't hesitate to kill Jonathan that's kind of the big thing about it is like like Zod's stance is I don't care who you are if you're part of the house of L I will kill you like I will I will eliminate you so seeing him do something like that scares the wits out of Superman because the response is like Rogel will kill me if he gets the chance and like Zod will kill Jonathan. He's fighting a battle on two fronts. And so it's, it's it's pandemonium and it's really like parental instincts kicking in. But the cool thing about this is they sort of get a saving grace out of nowhere when Supergirl arrives. Now, this kind of leads into the next story, but I do want to talk about this for a second. The arrival of Supergirl is intriguing here because in reality, while Supergirl is by and large stronger than Superman, you don't really see that play out all that often. And a lot of it's because she kind of has her own stories out there in the middle of nowhere. That's really what's been going on with Rebirth. She's just kind of out there, kind of a satellite character that doesn't really get involved in the Justice League uh, Justice League antics, and she's not really involved in much of anything that happens. She's just sort of out there doing her own thing. But Super Supergirl has historically been more powerful than Superman. Like, it's, it's really been that way since Crisis on Infinite Earths, and even before the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Now, a lot of that's because she's older, had more exposure to, like, Yellow Suns and so on. The, the gist of this is that because she's older, because she's more capable, you would expect her being thrown in here to turn the tide. And we don't really know if it will, but I assume that it will. But that's the nature of Bendis, is we don't really know. We're, we're kind of wondering. <laughs> <laughs> it could be that Bendis is kind of like, no, there's no reason Supergirl should be more powerful than Superman, and she'll just kind of be relegated to like a support character. Or it could be that Bendis goes with like the classic Supergirl archetype. She shows up and absolutely wrecks Rogelzar and General Zod, like takes them out for the most part by herself. I doubt she'll be able to do that much on her own, but there's no reason to believe that she can't because she's had some pretty impressive feats in the past. So I don't know, it's, it really is kind of a crapshoot, and it really is one of these things where like it can kind of go either way. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.